अल्हम्दुलिल्लाह व सलात व सलाम अल रसूलुल्लाह व अला अलिया साहिबे अजमीन अम्मा बाद अऊजु बिल्लाहि मिनश शैतानिर रजीम बिस्मिल्लाहिर रहमानिर रहीम व कुल जाल हक व जाकल बातिल इनल बातिल काना जहुका रब्बि शली सदरी व सल्ली अमरी व हल्लुल उग्दत मिन लिसानी यफकाउ कौली my respected my respected elders and the respected datuk speaker datuk dukstek financial officer the datuk vice chancellor and my teachers and staff and my dear students i welcome all of you with this samay greeting assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala be on all of you. It's a pleasure to be once again back in Malaysia, especially in the state of Terengganu, and it's an honour for me to be invited by the Chief Minister of Terengganu, especially in this University of Terengganu, Malaysia. The topic of this evening's talk of mine is Islam, the solution. for the problems of humanity islam comes from the root word salam which means peace it's also derived from the arabic word salm which means to submit your will to allah subhanahu wa taala almighty god islam in short means peace acquired by submitting your will to allah subhanahu wa taala and anyone who acquires this peace by submitting his will to allah subhanahu wa taala is called as a muslim many people have a misconception that islam is a new religion which came into existence 14 years back and prophet muhammad peace be upon him was the founder of this religion in fact islam is there since time immemorial since man set foot on this earth and prophet muhammad peace be upon him is not the founder of this religion but he is the last and final messenger of allah subhanahu wa taala of islam when we analyze most of the religions they cater to the spiritual aspects of the human being while some cater to the physical aspects islam alhamdulillah caters to both the spiritual as well as physical aspects of the human being and the topic of this morning's talk of mine is islam the solution to the problems of humanity and i would like to ask the question that who is the one who can give the best solution to the problems of humanity do you think is dr zakir naik and the answer is no do you think it is the president of usa and the answer is no the reply is the creator of the human beings allah subhanahu wa taala almighty god is the best one who can give the solution to the problem of humanity and the reply and the answer to these solutions for the problem of humanity is given in the last and final revelation of allah subhanahu wa taala that is the glorious quran this glorious quran has the solution to the problems of human kind the glorious quran is a proclamation to humanity it is the most positive book in the world it's a fountain of mercy and wisdom it's a guide to the erring it's a warning to the heedless it's an assurance to those in doubt it's a solace to the suffering and a hope to those in despair this glorious quran has the solution for humanity and many muslims think that the quran was only revealed for the muslims in fact if you read the quran the quran was not revealed only for the muslims or the arabs it was revealed for the whole of humankind 
and Allah says in the Quran in Surah Ibrahim chapter number 14 verse number 1 Alif Lam Ra we have revealed to thee Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him this book so that he may lead us mankind from darkness to light Allah says in Surah Ibrahim chapter number 14 verse number 52 that here is a message for humankind let them take warning from let them know there is one God let the men of understanding take heed Allah repeats the message in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2 verse 185 Ramadan was the month in which the Quran was revealed as a guidance to humankind as a criteria to judge right from wrong Allah says in Surah Zumur chapter number 39 verse number 41 that we have revealed to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the Quran so that he may instruct the humankind not only instruct the Muslims or the Arabs but the whole of humankind and Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him he was the last and final messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah says in the Quran in Surah Azab chapter number 33 was 40 ma kana muhammadun aba ahadim min rijalikum wal akhir rasulullah wa khatim an nabiyyin wa kana allah bi kulli shay'in alima muhammad peace be upon him is not the father of any of you men but he is a messenger of allah and a seal of the prophet allah is all knowing full of wisdom all the previous prophets that came before prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam they were sent only for their people and the message which they brought was meant to be followed for a particular time period but because prophet muhammad peace be upon him was the last and final messenger he was not sent only for the muslims or the arabs he was sent for the whole of humankind and allah says in surah ambiya chapter number 21 verse number 107 that we have sent thee not but as a mercy to all the creatures as a mercy to the whole of humanity as a mercy to all the worlds Allah repeats the message in the Quran in Surah Sabah chapter number 34 verse number 28 Muma arsallaka illa kafatan linnas bashira wa nazira that we have sent thee not but as a universal messenger giving glad tidings and warning them against sin but the most of the human beings yet do not know because prophet muhammad peace be upon him and the glorious quran were the last prophet and the last revelation of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they were not sent only for the muslims or the arabs they were sent for the whole of humankind today we find in the international media whether it be the international newspapers the international magazines the radio broadcast station the television channels the satellite channels we find there is virulent propaganda regarding Islam and we find that the international media today is bombarding misinformation about Islam it is spreading misconception about Islam and according to an article that was published in the Newsweek on 16th of April 1979 it stated that there were more than 150,000 books written, written against Islam in a span of 150 years between 1800 and 1950 if you do a calculation 60,000 divided by 150 divided by 365 the number of days every day more than one book was written against Islam in a span of 150 years from 1800 to 1950 and after 9-11 this has reached epidemic level every day several books are written against Islam there are various strategies various strategies used by the media to malign Islam one of the most common strategies used is that they pick up the black sheep of the Muslim community and they portray as though they are exemplary Muslims we have black sheep in every community the media picks up these black sheep and they portray as though they are exemplary Muslim and I always say 
that if you want to judge a religion don't look at his followers analyze the authentic scriptures of that religion so if you want to understand Islam don't look at the Muslims look at the glorious Quran and the authentic sayings of the last and final messenger Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam I would like to give an example that if there is a latest Mercedes in the market 600 SEL 2016 model and you want to know how good the car is a person who does not know how to drive the car sits behind the steering wheel and he bangs up the car who will you blame will you blame the car or the driver who will you blame but naturally the driver if you really want to know how good the car is you have to look at its specifications what is the speed what is the gear ratio what are the safety measures does it have anti-brake locking system what is the fuel efficiency and then you can analyze whether the car is good or not if you really want to test drive the car put behind the steering wheel an expert driver and the best exemplary Muslim is the last and final messenger Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the other strategy used by the media is they quote verses of the Quran and the Hadith out of context I'll let you give you an example that many critics and skeptics of Islam they quote the Quran trying to prove that Islam is a religion of terrorism and they say that the Quran says wherever you find a kafir a non-muslim you kill him and they say this is mentioned in the Quran in Surah Tawbah chapter number 9 verse number 5 and if you open the Quran and you read Surah Tawbah chapter number 9 verse number 5 it does say that wherever you find a kafir you kill him but this verse is quoted out of context for the context you have to read from verse number 1 of Surah Tawbah chapter number 9 here we come to know that there was a peace treaty between the Muslims and the mushriks of Makkah and this peace treaty was unilaterally broken by the mushriks of Makkah by the time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reaches verse number 5 of Surah Tawbah chapter number 9 he gives an ultimatum to the mushriks and he tells them that they put things straight in 4 months time otherwise a declaration of war and then the verse continues that in the battlefield Allah is telling the muslims that wait for the, them in every stratagem of war and wherever you find the kafir the mushriks you kill them here this verse is revealed in a battlefield but natural any army general suppose there's a war going if there's a war taking place between USA and Vietnam and if the president of USA or the army general of USA tells the American soldiers that wherever you find the Vietnamese on the battlefield you kill them but natural it is normal but if I quote it out of context and just say that the president of America said wherever you find the Vietnamese you kill them I will make him sound like a butcher but in the battlefield to boost up the morale of the soldiers the army general or the president has to use this word so similarly in the Quran it talks about a situation in the battlefield where the enemies are coming to fight so the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Muslims that don't get scared fight them and kill them where you find them it is but natural in context in the battlefield And many of the skeptics and the critics of Islam, including Arun Shuri, who comes from India, he writes in his book, The World of Fatwas, he quotes the same verse, and after verse number 5, he jumps to verse number 7. You know why? Because verse number 6 has the reply to the sickness of these critics. Verse number 6 in Surah Tawbah chapter number 9 says that if the Kafir, if the Mushriks, if the non-Muslims 
want asylum, want peace, don't just give it to them. Escort them to a place of security so that they shall hear the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Today, the most generous army general will tell his soldiers, let, let the enemies go. Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Muslims that if the enemies want peace, if they want asylum, don't just give it to them, escort them to a place of security. And whenever you find any verse in the Quran that talks about war, when having war with the enemies, it is always followed up by saying somewhat similar that peace is always better. Anywhere in the Quran. That means Islam is a religion of peace. And it promotes peace. Only as a last resort in self-defense or where it comes to present the truth if you have to fight then be prepared to fight and every country in the world has a police force to see to it that they use sometimes force to let peace prevail in that country the third strategy used by the media is they mistranslate the words from the Quran or the Hadith and they malign Islam. Today, the most misunderstood word in Islam is the word Jihad. It is not only misunderstood by the non-Muslim, it's also misunderstood by the Muslims. The amount the media has done propaganda and has spread misinformation about this word jihad, it is not only misunderstood by the non-Muslims, it's even misunderstood by the Muslims. And today, most of the human beings, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, they think that any war fought by any Muslim for any reason, whether it be for personal gain, whether it be for wealth, whether it be for power, whether it be for land, whether it be for language, is called as jihad. Jihad does not mean any war fought by any Muslim for any reason, whether it be for personal gain, whether it be for personal gain, whether it be for wealth, whether it be for fame, whether it be for land, whether it be for language. Jihad comes from the Arabic word jihada, which means to strive, which means to struggle. So jihad basically means to strive and struggle. In the Islamic context, jihad means to strive and struggle against one's own evil inclination. Jihad also means to strive and struggle to make the society better. Jihad also means to strive and struggle against oppression. Jihad also means to strive and struggle in a battlefield in self-defense. Jihad basically means to strive and struggle. For example, if a student striving to pass in the examination in Arabic, we will say he is doing jihad. And many people have a misconception that jihad can only be done by Muslims. In fact, there are two places in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that even the non-Muslims did jihad. Allah says in the Quran, Allah says in Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 14 and 15, Allah says in verse number 14 that we have enjoined on the human beings to be kind to the parents. In travel upon travel did the mother bore you and in years twin was the meaning. The next verse, Surah Luqman chapter number 31 verse number 15 says, But if your parents do jihad, strive and struggle to make you worship somebody else besides Allah of whom you have no knowledge, then do not obey them. But yet live with them with love and compassion. A similar message is repeated in the Quran in Surah An Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 8, that we have enjoined on the human beings to be good to the parents. But if your parents do jihad, strive and struggle to make you worship somebody else besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of whom you have no knowledge, then do not obey them. Here, the Quran is talking about non Muslim parents striving and struggling doing jihad to make their children do shirk. But this jihad 
is called as jihad fi sabi shaitan striving and struggling in the way of the shaitan in the way of the satan what we muslims are supposed to do is jihad fi sabi lillah striving and struggling in the way of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and whenever the word jihad is used it usually means jihad fi sabi lillah jihad in the way of allah unless it is specified like in surah luqman chapter 31 verse 15 or in surah ankabut chapter 29 verse some way otherwise it's understood whenever the word jihad is used it mainly refers to jihad fi sabi striving and struggling in the way of allah and many of the orientalists and even some of the so-called muslim scholars in inverted commas they translate the word jihad as holy war if you translate holy war into arabic it is harbum muqaddasa this word harbum muqaddasa is nowhere to be found in the quran nor in any of the hadith of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam because jihad doesn't mean holy war it does harbu muqaddasa jihad means to strive and struggle but the media has made it so common that they translate the word jihad as holy war jihad basically means to strive and struggle the other strategy used by the media is they mention things about islam which are alien to islam the media says that Islam does not give rights to women. Islam is against reason and logic. Islam is against science. And I've given talks on various topics. Women's rights in Islam proving that Islam is the religion which gives the maximum rights to the women. Islam is religion of reason and logic. I've given out Quran and modern science compatible or incompatible proving that the glorious Quran is compatible with the established science the media today many a times they say things about islam which are there in islam but they say that these things are the problems for humanity and if we analyze the things what they point out as problems for humanity is actually the solution for the problems of humanity and one allegation made by the media is that muslims are fundamentalist what is the meaning of the word fundamentalist a fundamentalist by definition means a person who follows the fundamentals of one particular subject for example if a person wants to be a good mathematician he should know follow and practice the fundamentals of maths unless he is a fundamentalist in the field of maths he cannot be a good mathematician for a person to be a good scientist he should know follow and practice the fundamentals of science unless he is a fundamentalist in the field of science he cannot be a good scientist you can't paint all fundamentals with the same brush that all are good or all are bad depending in which field the person is a fundamentalist you have to label him, label, label him accordingly. For example, if you have a fundamentalist doctor whose main aim is to save human lives, he's good for the society. On the other hand, if you have a fundamentalist robber who robs people, he's bad for the society. You can't paint all fundamentals with the same brush that all are good or all are bad depending in which field the person is a fundamentalist we have to label him accordingly as far as i am concerned i am a fundamentalist muslim and i am proud to be a fundamentalist muslim because i know i follow and i strive to practice the fundamentals of islam and i know that there is not a single fundamental of islam that is against humanity as a whole there may be certain fundamentals whose reason and logic the non-muslims may not be aware of but the moment you tell them the reason and the logic behind these fundamentals in islam there is not a single human being in the world who can point out a single fundamental of islam which is against humanity as a whole 
when you read oxford dictionary there we come to know that what is the meaning of the word fundamentalist according to the oxford dictionary fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the ancient to the teaching of the ancient scriptures of any religion but when we read the revised edition of the oxford dictionary there is a slight change it says that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the ancient teachings of any scriptures of any religion especially islam the word especially islam has been added with the moment you hear the word fundamentalist you start thinking of a muslim and you start thinking that he is an extremist and many a time we muslim we go on the defend no 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 i am not a fundamentalist i am not an extremist i tell the people i am an extremist i am extremely kind i am extremely merciful i am extremely honest i am extremely loving what's wrong in being extremely merciful extremely kind extremely loving extremely honest you can't be honest when it benefits you and if you go in loss you don't want to be honest and quran says you have to be extremely kind extremely loving extremely honest so if you have to be a good muslim you have to be extremely kind you have to be extremely merciful you have to be extremely merciful you have to be extremely honest yes we should be extremists in the correct direction not in the wrong direction so many a times we muslims we are apologetic we go on the defense no i am not a fundamentalist i am not an extremist we have to turn the tables over we don't have to behave apologetically and if you have knowledge of your deen surely you will be proud to be a muslim we have the media today that says what is the meaning of the word terrorist a terrorist by definition means a person who causes terror and many a times two different labels are given to the same individual for the same activity and a very good example i can give you of my country india more than 70 years back before it got its independence it was ruled ruled by the britishers somewhat similar to malaysia but malaysia was ruled by many different countries last was last was england more than 70 years back when india was ruled by the britishers there were many indians who were fighting for the freedom of the country and these freedom fighters indians by the british government they were called as terrorist but the same people by the common indians we called them as freedom fighters as patriots same people same activity but two different labels if you agree with the view of the british government they had a right to rule over india then you have to call these people as terrorist but if you agree with the view of the common indians that the britishers came to india to do business they have no right to rule over us then you would call these people as freedom fighters same people same activity but two different labels and many a times when i address the indian press and when they ask me the question that why a muslim terrorist so i ask them a counter question that do you believe bhagat singh that he was a terrorist the british government they call bhagat singh as a terrorist do you believe the terrorist they say no so i tell them even i don't believe he is a terrorist i said why don't you believe he is a terrorist because we know the indian history the britishers came they were ruling us they were unjust these were freedom fighters so even i agree bhagat singh was in the terrorist he was a freedom fighter so now when the britishers when the english man is saying that bhagat singh is a terrorist and you don't agree now the same english man is saying muslim the terrorist why do you agree they start laughing hey <laughs> have you done the check have you checked up whether they are speaking the truth so allah says in the quran in surah hujurat chapter number 49 verse number 6 whenever you get information always check it up before you pass it on to the third person so the media 
they are maligning Islam by spreading misconception of Islam. And today the media says that Islam is an intolerant religion. And I give them a reply by saying, yes, I agree with you that Islam is an intolerant religion. We are intolerant to those things which we feel are wrong and what you think is right. We are intolerant to corruption. We are intolerant to injustice. We are intolerant to discrimination. We are intolerant towards victimization, towards racism. Islam is an intolerant religion. It is intolerant to those things which we feel are bad for society and you think is good for society. Islam is intolerant towards alcoholism. Islam is intolerant towards drug addiction. Islam is intolerant towards pornography, towards prostitution, towards adultery, towards fornication. Islam is an intolerant religion. Islam is an intolerant religion to those things which are causing problem for humanity. You may think it is good. You may like pornography. You may like prostitution. But we know. Islam knows. Our creator knows. That this is a problem for humanity. So Islam is an intolerant religion. It is intolerant to those things which create a problem for humanity. But for those things which are solution for humanity, Islam is not only tolerant, it encourages it. And many a times makes it compulsory for the Muslims to follow. Islam is not a problem to humanity, it is the solution to the problems of humanity. But this solution, what Islam gives, does not go down the throat of the Westerners. Those who want to enjoy this world, who encourage alcoholism, who encourage drug addiction, encourage prostitution, encourage pornography, saying everyone has a right. Islam is intolerant to those things which create a problem in humanity. And normally if you analyze, most of the religions they tell its followers to do good things. But Islam, besides speaking good things, shows you a way how to achieve the state of goodness. I'll let you give an example. Most of the religions say that you should not rob. Christianity says that. Hinduism says that. Islam says the same. So what is the difference between Islam and the other religion? The difference in Islam is that Islam shows you a way how to achieve a state in which people will not rob. Islam has a system of zakat that is any rich person who has a saving of more than the nisab level more than 85 grams of gold he or she every lunar year should give 2.5 percent of that excess wealth in charity if every rich human being in the world gives charity poverty will be eradicated from this world there will not be a single human being who will die of hunger after this if anyone robs Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 38, As to the thief, be it a man or a woman, chop off his or her hand as a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The non-Muslim will say, chopping off the hands in this age of science and technology, Islam is a barbaric religion. It's a ruthless way of life. And they think that when you go to Saudi Arabia, where this law is practiced, Every second person you come across will have his hand chopped off. I have been to Saudi Arabia about more than 100 times. I have not come across a single man whose hands have been chopped off. There will be some whose hands have been chopped off, but I did not find any. It's not as common as the non-Muslim think it is. The law is so strict that a person will think a million times before robbing. And do you know today, we look up to most of the human beings look up to America as the most advanced country in the world, USA. Do you know USA today has the maximum rate of theft in the world? Do you know today USA has the maximum rate of crime in the world? According to US statistics of US Department of Justice, every C 
second in America one crime is taking place. Every two seconds one theft is taking place. Every two seconds. All of you are here since 10 o'clock. Already one and a half hour has passed. 90, 90 minutes multiply by multiply by 60. Already 540 crimes may have taken place in USA since the time we are here. I am asking the question that if you implement the Islamic Sharia that every rich person in USA gives zakat 2.5% of his excess wealth in charity after that anyone drops chop of his or her I'm asking the question will the rate of theft in America will it increase will it remain the same or will it decrease increase remain the same or decrease it's a simple answer. You don't have to do a PhD to know this answer. You implement the Sharia, you get results. That is the reason I say Islam, besides speaking good things, shows you a way how to achieve that state of goodness. Let me give you one more example. Most of the religions say that you should not tease a girl, you should not molest a girl, you should not rape a girl. Hinduism says that, Christianity says that, Islam says the same. So what is the difference between Islam and the other religion? The difference between Islam and the other religion is that Islam shows you a way how to achieve a state in which people will not molest or rape a woman. Islam has a system of hijab. Normally, most of the speakers speak about hijab for the woman, but Allah in the Quran first speaks about the hijab for the man and then for the woman. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nur chapter number 24 verse number 30, say to the believing man that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. Whenever a man looks at a woman, any brazen thought comes in his mind, any unashamed thought comes in his mind, he should lower his gaze. There was a Muslim once who was staring at a girl for a long time. So I told him, brother, what are you doing? So he said, our beloved prophet said, the first glance is forgiven, the second is prohibited, I have not completed half my glance. What did the prophet mean by saying the first glance is forgiven, the second is prohibited? That does not mean you can look at a woman, stare at a woman for 10 minutes without blinking and saying I have not completed my glance. What the prophet meant is that if you look at a woman, do not intentionally look at her again to feast on her beauty. The so first, Allah speaks about hijab for the man. Then the next verse Allah says in Surah Nur chapter number 24 verse number 31 Say to the believing woman that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty and, this, and draw her head covering over the bosom and display not her beauty except what appears ordinarily of except in front of her husband, the father, her son and a list of mehram is given There are basically six criteria for hijab Number one which is given in the Quran and the Sahih Hadith Number one is that is the extent for the man it's from the navel to the knee for the woman the complete body should be covered the only parts that can be seen are the face and the hands up to the wrist there are some scholars who say that even the face should be covered as far as the remaining five criteria are concerned they are the same for the man and the woman the second is the clothes they wear it should not be tight fitting so that it reveals the shape of the body Number three, it should not be transparent or translucent so that you can see through. Number four, it should not be glamorous so that it attracts the opposite sex. Number five, it should not resemble that of the opposite sex. And number six, it should not resemble that of the non-Muslim. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 59, O Prophet, Tell your wives and your daughters and the believing women that when they go abroad, they should put on the jilbab, they should put on the cloak, the overcoat. So that you shall be recognized and it will prevent you from being molested. So Allah says in the Quran that hijab has been prescribed for the women so that it will prevent them from being molested. I would like to ask you a question. If there are two sisters who are identical twins both of them are beautiful equally beautiful 
and if they are walking down the streets of Terangano and one of them is wearing the western clothes mini skirt with shorts with a low neck and the other twin sister she's wearing the Islamic hijab complete body covered the only part that is seen is the face and hand of the wrist and if both of them are walking down the streets of Terangano and around the corner there is a hooligan who is waiting for a catch who is waiting to tease a girl I am asking you the question which girl will he tease? will he tease the sister who is wearing the western clothes or will he tease the girl who is wearing the Islamic hijab who will he tease? will he tease the girl wearing the western clothes or the girl which is wearing the Islamic hijab western clothes simple question the simple answer you invite and you receive that's the reason Islam says Islam has prescribed hijab to protect the woman for the modesty and after that Islam says if anyone rapes any woman he gets capital punishment non-muslims will say capital punishment death penalty in this age of science and technology in this 21st century and I have asked many non-muslims thousands of them that god forbid somebody rapes your mother or somebody rapes your daughter and if the rapist is born in front of you and if you are made the judge what punishment will you give to the rapist and that not all the non-muslims said we will put him to death some went to the extent of saying we will torture him to death why these double standards somebody rapes your mother your daughter you want to put him to death somebody rapes somebody else's mother or daughter you say death penalty the barbaric law why why these double standards i'm asking you the question that if today according to the statistics of usa in 2013 statistics according to u.s department of justice every day 2713 cases of rape take place Every 32 seconds, one rape is taking place. We are here for approximately one hour 45 minutes. In this time, already more than, more than 150 rapes may have taken place in USA. I am asking the question that if you implement the Islamic Sharia in USA, that whenever a man looks at a woman, if any unashamed thought comes, he should lower his gaze. All the women should be Islamically dressed, wearing the hijab, complete body covered except the face and the hand of the wrist. And after that, if any man rapes a woman, he gets capital punishment. I am asking the question, will the rate of rape in USA, will it increase? Will it remain the same or will it decrease? It will decrease. It's a practical law. You implement the Sharia and you get results. That is the reason I say that Islam, besides speaking good things, shows you a way how to achieve the state of goodness. Islam is a practical religion. It has the solution for the problems of humanity. But most of the solution does not go down the throat of the Westerners. They think it is restricting their freedom. If it's a solution to restrict your freedom, then it should be restricted. Freedom for doing things which are problems for other human beings. And the media today, they malign that Islam does not give rights to the woman. In fact, today, the Western talk of women's liberalization is nothing but a disguised form of exploitation of a body, deprivation of a soul, and degradation of honor. The Western society, when they say they claim to uplift the woman, they are actually degrading her to a status of concubine to that of a mistresses and society butterflies with a mere tools in the hands of sex play mere tools in the hands of sex marketeers and pleasure seekers hidden behind the colorful screen of art and culture in the name of art and culture the westerners they're selling their mothers they're selling their wives they're selling their daughters and you find in this media that many a times in most of the advertisements you will find a woman even in the advertisement of motorcycle we know in the world the majority of the people that ride the motorcycle are gents so why should a woman be in the ad of a motorcycle but not 
capital to attract. And I was told of a very famous ad of the BMW car. You know, BMW car, it's in competition with the Mercedes. Mercedes is an elegant BMW for the youngsters, good pickup, fast car. I was told in one of the ads of BMW, in front of the BMW car, there was a woman who was standing with the bikini and the ad said, test drive her now. Who? The girl or the car? What are they doing? They are selling their daughters, they are selling their wives, they are selling their mothers in the name of women liberalization. If this is what you say is liberalization, then we Muslims don't want this liberalization. We are happy with our deen. Islam has come to uplift the women. And Islam shows a way how the women should maintain the modesty by wearing the hijab. Otherwise, you will go back to the olden days where women were only used for sex and pleasure. In fact, Islam has the solution to the problems of womankind, to the problems of humankind. And today, however much the media is trying to malign Islam, the more it's trying to malign Islam, the more it is growing. Allah says in the Quran, Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 54, Makhru Allah, wallahu khairul makhri. They planned and plotted. Allah too planned. Allah is the best of planner. Through this media war, you know, they say, war for peace, war for peace. It is not war for peace, it is war on peace, war on Islam. After 9-11, you see, there is a surge of media war on Islam. But in spite of this, Alhamdulillah, today, Islam is the fastest going religion in the world. It is the fastest going religion in USA. It is the fastest going religion in Europe. It is the fastest growing religion in the world. After 9-11, in a span of about nine months, in USA alone, 34,000 Americans accepted Islam. In Europe, according to Johan Redley, in a span of 10 months, more than 22,000 Europeans accepted Islam. And out of those accepting Islam, two-thirds of the non-Muslims are women. If Islam is against women, then why are the American women accepting Islam? Why are the European women, in, why are the European women accepting Islam? Because Islam has the solution to the problem of womankind. Islam has the solution to the problem of humankind. And I would like to end my talk with the quotation of the glorious Quran from which I started my talk of Surah Al-Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 81, where Allah says, وَقُلْ جَالْ حَقَزَاكَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ قَانَ زَوْكَ When truth is heard again, falsehood, falsehood perishes. For falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. وَآخِرُ الدَّعْوَانَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ